Um, before diving into questions, just a real quick bit of background for those uh, who are perhaps uh, newer to the foundation or uh, who I haven't interacted with. Um, so my name is Josh Summer, co-founder and executive director of the Cordoma Foundation, 17-year Cordoma survivor, was um, diagnosed at age 18 back in 2006 and had a great 16-year run with um, no recurrences and, in, um, and, and good health. Uh, but then last year, I uh, discovered that I had a small recurrence at the site of my original tumor, um, was successfully treated with uh, further surgery, and I'm now essentially fully recovered, which I am exceedingly grateful for, and to be honest, um, is not something that I had imagined possible when I was first diagnosed. I think probably many of us have been told that you know, once the tumor returns, the treatment options are not great. Certainly surgery and irradiation become more difficult, but um, oftentimes that is the case. I, I, I was really lucky in that um, the, the recurrence was small and localized and amenable to resection. That's obviously not always the case, um, but, uh, but doing great. Um, I am dialing in from my home in Hillsborough, North Carolina, uh, where I have a four and a half and a seven month old. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to get a chance to uh, to talk with you all today. So uh, I guess without further ado, we can just dive right in. I'll just say um, nothing is out of bounds. Feel free to ask anything. The only thing I can't um, dive into is kind of giving uh, uh, personal medical advice. We don't give medical advice at the foundation. Um, so we can talk about generally speaking, what's known about Cordoma, what's known about treatment options and treatment options that are, might be available for different uh, patients with, with um, different presentations or stages of disease. But um, for anything uh, kind of more detailed about your own personal medical case, um, we're, we're always going to recommend uh, speaking with an experienced uh, Cordoma physician. Um, and then there's additional one-on-one -on -one support that we can offer through our patient navigation program. And Shannon Lazinski, maybe Shannon can raise her hand. Um, Shannon is our director of patient services, uh, has interacted with thousands of Cordoma patients across the world and is an incredible wellspring of knowledge and information. So if anyone does have more detailed personal questions that you'd like to follow up with, um, Shannon's the person as well as her colleague, Andrea, um, and you can reach them through support at Cordoma.org. So, with that out of the way, um, we'll just go straight into questions. I see that Richard has raised his hand first. So um, Richard, uh, fire away. And, and if, if you're comfortable just sharing, you know, 30 seconds um, kind of background, what brings you to the call, that'd be great. That's great. I just I just found another phone is, uh, but anyway, what, my question is this, um, uh, surgeons, are they talking to other surgeons? I mean, Basically, what I want to know is, um, it, uh, how can I say this? Uh, is there like a general standards of like, so like if you do have a sacral, is there general standards of how to operate? Now, I, know, I know every patient is different. So is there like a general standard out there that these surgeons know? And, and are, are they talking to each other? I mean, really talking to each other? Or does each one have an ego where they just... They get a number of these and they just go about it, about doing it. Because I can add an example where I, 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 there was a thing where I didn't have radiation. I had my surgery and I didn't have the radiation, but other people had radiation and surgery on that, on the, 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 the sacrum. Yep. And my doctor didn't want to do uh, radiation because he says, well, we can use that as a second option where if you have the radiation, then it might reduce the 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 tumor and then you can operate. Yep. But um, my doctor uh, said no. So I'm just wondering, do do the surgeons actually communicate with each other is, or could it be better? Yeah, it's a great set of questions. I think that I'll just address the point of surgery versus radiation or both. Um, the short answer is we don't have a definitive answer. Um, so, uh, we're kind of operating in a data poor context and therefore the recommendations from different doctors may vary. Um, this question is being answered through a prospective study. So following patients over time, um, 
at a number of sites in Europe. So more than a dozen sites are all working together um, to pool their patient experience and to treat patients according to um, kind of a standard protocol. Some patients receive radiation, some patients receive surgery, some patients receive both. And then we'll be able to definitively compare apples to apples, uh, you know, who does better. Right now, um, they're, they're, the data comes from individual case series at um, you know, primarily large, uh, high volume institutions. So Mass General, MD Anderson, Hopkins, a number of institutions in Europe, and um, and there's con the data is somewhat conflicting, so there isn't a straightforward answer. Um, that being said, in general, it appears that um, the uh, the best uh, the best shot at achieving long term disease control, long term outcomes, probably for most patients, involves surgery plus radiation. But that can't be said definitively across the board, and there's a lot of different um, variables that come into play that that um, might be different from patient to patient. For example, how large the tumor is, where it's located, is it amenable to a, a complete resection um, with negative margins, um, and not just negative margins, but wide margins. So all of these things uh, play into the recommendations that individual surgeons will make. That being said, um, I think there is generally um, a correlation between uh, the volume and the or the experience that a particular surgeon has and the kind of quality of care that they're providing. That's not to say that, you know, just because you go to a high volume site, you're going to have great care. It's not to say that you go to a surgeon who doesn't see a lot of corona patients, you're not going to get good care. It's just that in general, this is a very complex disease. There's a lot of nuance that goes into designing treatment approaches and experience counts. And the final thing I'll say is there, there is um, a, a set of consensus guidelines that have, that have been put together by a group of over 60 physicians that include surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. Um, and there's several sets of these. One, the first one was developed and um, focused on uh, primary tumors, um, and it, it, it kind of addressed the, the, the approach to treating primary tumors. Um, the second focused on recurrent disease. And then the third actually went into great detail on the technical aspects of dealing with um, sacral tumors and trying to prevent recurrence. And um, um, so Shannon has just posted into the chat, thank you, Shannon, um, a link to those guidelines, as well as a link to the clinical trial that I mentioned in Europe. Um, I think just to sum it all up, high, going to an experienced surgeon is critical. There are treatment guidelines, but even within those treatment guidelines, there's kind of uh, variation and room for an, a, a, you know, a need to apply judgment and exp uh, you know, experience accounts when applying that judgment. And then the final thing, as far as our doctors talking with one another, it really varies. Um, you know, we host research workshops uh, roughly every other year at, at which the leading Cordoma clinicians attend and, um, and, you know, and, and share cases and share results. There's also, as I mentioned, this consensus group that has met several times and shared, um, you know, perspectives and data. Um, there's other professional societies at which these surgeons interact. So I'd say if you're going to a, a surgeon who treats a large number of Cordoma patients or a high volume site, they are all very aware of what's happening at other sites. If you're going to a surgeon who maybe doesn't treat as many Cordoma patients, doesn't go to the Cordoma Foundation's research workshops, doesn't go to other professional society meetings, it's possible that they are somewhat behind the times in the approach that they are taking. Um, and so, again, it just comes back to finding an experienced physician is, is the best course of action in pretty much all cases. Thank you. A absolutely. Uh, Paul has a question. Paul, go ahead. Oh, Paul, uh, you're, on, you're on mute. Josh, I cannot thank you enough for all that you've done for us in the Cordoma community and also your staff. I am so grateful. Uh, I'm a stage four 
patient and uh, pinning my hopes on a BRCA drug. Two years ago, I read that a drug might be available within two to five years. Just read your new announcement on a milestone reached. I'm wondering, is it uh, reasonable to hope that within a few years, two to three years, maybe that a drug might be available for BRCA? Yeah, thanks for the question and thanks for your, your kind words. Um, so it's really hard to know in drug discovery how long things are going to take. Um, and I think it's really important that we don't overpromise. Is it possible we could get to a clinical trial in the next couple of years with the brachyuri drug? Yes. Um, there are multiple shots on goal right now. So multiple different academic groups, multiple different companies that are developing brachyuri uh, targeted therapies. Um, using multiple different therapeutic modalities. Um, so some that disrupt the function of the protein, some that cause the brachyuri protein to be depleted or kind of removed from the cell, others that prevent it from being created in the first place, others that go after it from a kind of a, a immunological approach. So all of these are happening in parallel. We don't know yet, you know, which is going to be um, the winning horse or winning horses, so to speak. but Yes, conceivably, there are potential paths to brachyuri therapies entering clinical trials in the next few years. Um, and that is being accelerated by a number of factors. So perhaps most notably um, in the last year or so, um, as some of you might be aware, we've, uh, we've, we've launched our own lab at the Cordoma Foundation and just in the last six months have begun developing capabilities to facilitate um, the preclinical, so like in the lab evaluation of brachyuri drugs. And why that's so important is that those capabilities, they take a number of months, if not, you know, a, a year or so to stand up, to get from, you know, concept to operation. And if every company that was working on developing a brachyuri drug had to recreate those same capabilities, so first of all, it's, it's wasteful from a resource allocation perspective, but also it just extends the timeline, makes things take so much longer. But now we're in a position where as companies develop um, compounds that are intended to target brachyuri and they think that they're, they, they could uh, be onto something, we can very quickly and easily test those compounds um, in the appropriate um, kind of in the appropriate tests or what they're called assays um, in Cordoma cells. And we're already working with a, a several companies to do that, um, as well as academic groups. So, um, you know, I think that uh, it's it's a very hopeful and exciting time right now. I, again, I don't want to overpromise. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult target. Um, uh, so people may have heard the, the, the word undruggable used, and that is, I believe, a misnomer. I think it's more appropriate to say difficult to drug or not yet drugged, but it gets thrown around in the in the world of drug discovery, um, and 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 it's because certain proteins, which so, so basically almost all drugs target proteins. That's where kind of the action happens in cells, um, and certain proteins are more difficult to develop drugs against because they don't have features on them that are amenable to drugs binding or kind of latching on or altering their function. And it was assumed for many years that brachyuri was undruggable because it fell into a class of proteins that historically had been very difficult to develop compounds that would interact with. But we've now definitively shown that you can bind compounds to brachyuri. And so that's the thing that is, is giving us the confidence to say, yes, we can get, you know, it, it's theoretically possible we can get to um, therapies that could that could go into clinical trials in the next few years, because no longer is that kind of theoretical hurdle in, uh, or that theoretical hurdle has been overcome. We know we can bind to the to the protein, and therefore we know we can the the, the technology exists to be able to build from that foothold um, to create compounds that are suitable to take into the patients, and that is happening right now on multiple different fronts multiple different academic labs and companies um, are, are working on that right now. Thank you so much, Josh. And again, I, I appreciate everything you're doing so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate all your support as well. Uh, Thank Chris. You. Oh, 
Chris, I think you're on mute as well. Good afternoon, Josh. Hey, good, to see you. good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Good to see you and your team. To, to kind of leapfrog off of Paul's question, when, when the brachyuri becomes, I guess, more mature, for lack of a better term, do you perceive that might be a first treatment other than surgery and or radiation? A really, really good question. It's entirely possible. So right now, I think as probably everyone is aware, the standard therapy for chordoma is surgery and or radiation. In some cases, one, in some cases, the other, in some cases, both, as, as I alluded earlier. Um, there is, is pretty much no role for drug therapy or what's called systemic therapy in the upfront setting. And that is typical of many tumor types that uh, systemic therapies are, are reserved for either a kind of a locally advanced or metastatic disease. And certainly that's where therapies get tested first. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that by and large, a lot of chordoma patients do quite well um, at, you know, after their initial treatment. And by do quite well, I mean, the, the median survival is something like eight years and a lot of patients you know, live longer than that. And so it's really difficult to, to get an answer to whether your drug is helping if patients, if so many patients are doing that well. However, if you've had a recurrence or if you have advanced disease, the prognosis is not so great. And so in that setting, you can get answers to whether your drug is working much faster because you would expect patients in general to not live as long or you know, their tumor to progress. So that's one of the reasons why drugs are tested in the advanced setting first. There's another reason, which is a um, an ethics issue and it boils down to a, a risk benefit calculus. Almost all cancer drugs carry risks. And in order for a researcher or a company to get their trial approved, they have to demonstrate that the risk of the drug is justified by the potential benefit. And given how well so many patients do in the initial setting, and given the risks associated with many cancer drugs, you'd be hard pressed to find a an institutional review board, essentially an ethics board that would green light a clinical trial with a, you know, a, a, a toxic or, or, or potentially, um, uh, you know, a, a cancer drug with, with a side effect profile in the initial disease setting, unless you had evidence from the advanced disease setting that, that it really helps people. Um, so that's why we haven't seen clinical trials done in the initial disease setting, because we haven't demonstrated yet that there are drugs that really are helpful, even in the advanced disease setting. Um, if we can demonstrate that a brachyuri drug or any other drug, for example, is benefiting patients in the advanced disease setting, then the next thing to do would be to move it up in, in, kind of in, in the order of treatment. And conceivably, it could be either an adjuvant. So let's say you've had surgery and you've got residual tumor, then um, maybe you're treated with radiation plus a brachyuri drug or some other systemic therapy, or, or maybe just a systemic therapy like brachyuri drug instead of radiation. Or maybe even you, you treat prior to surgery and or radiation and see if you can shrink the tumor and uh, make surgery less risky or complicated, maybe obviate the need for radiation. That's called a neoadjuvant trial. And that has, has been far off for a long time, but now is starting to be, uh, because, because we are starting to see some positive results from clinical trials in the advanced setting, now we need to start looking down the line and planning for neoadjuvant trials, whether with the brachyuri drug or anything else. And in fact, at the upcoming research workshop, we have a breakout session where a key focus of, of the conversation is going to be on how do we do neoadjuvant trials for Cordoma. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, but even that we're able to have that conversation, I think is an exciting milestone because at previous research workshops and in you know, previous times when this has been discussed, it's been basically out of the realm of possibility because we haven't had any compounds, we haven't had any drugs that would even be suitable potentially for, uh, for that sort of clinical trial. So maybe there's a long way of saying, yes, eventually we hope that a brachyuri drug or and or other drugs could be used in the upfront setting, either in lieu of or um, in combination with surgery and radiation. And, and I heard something in your voice that you may not have, have caught or done intentionally, but I heard the word, yeah, we haven't yet demonstrated, which 
to me, holds promise. It's something you just said casually, hashtag yet. So I'm confident it's coming. And again, echoing Paul's appreciation for everything you and your team do for the Cordoma community. So thanks. Well, thank you, Chris. You've had a, a huge hand in it. Um, I think I think yet is the operative word. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's these cancer research takes time. Um, there's so many steps that you have to go through, but we have the I think the benefit now of being able to, to some extent, look into the future, and by that I mean, see what is coming down the pike, preclinically. So we we see. I mean, there's 80 plus drugs now have been tested in mouse models of Cordoma. And we see that some work and most don't, but some do. 10 of those now have gone into clinical trials and, or actually, excuse me, 11 now have gone into clinical trials. And it takes a long time for the results of those clinical trials to be published and to be presented, et cetera. But, um, you know, we, we get periodic updates to some extent uh, we hear anecdotal responses from patients, and we know that some of these drugs are helping patients. Whether they're going to become standard of care, I think is still TBD, but um, I think this year and next is going to be really pivotal for um, determining whether some of these drugs, like afatinib, like pemetrexid, like nivolumab, um, like cetuximab, things that people might have heard about that are in clinical trials now, determining whether those are going to become standard of care. But I think what we could say with pretty high certainty at this point is that the things that are coming next are better. So while those drugs are exciting and probably benefiting patients to some extent, the next wave is going to be better. And you know, if we're doing our job right, the next wave after that will be better. And that includes things like uh, like brachiuri drugs. Terrific, thanks. Absolutely. Okay, um, Ashish. Hi. Um, so. Uh... First of all, uh, great to see you, George. Uh, um, I was just, I was just wondering uh, if, if I'm a computational guy who want to get involved with the Cordoma Research Foundation and contributing my uh, computational expertise. Uh, you know, how do I go about it? Uh, and uh, a quick related question is: uh, We've all heard about uh, the transformative effect of uh, Chat GPT and generative AI. I was just wondering. Are there uh, are there ways it can benefit or accelerate drug discovery and you know impact uh, getting to a brachiuri drug or other drug faster? Uh, well, thanks for those questions. Uh, I'll answer the first one, which is we are now for the first time because of the lab starting to generate a quantity of data that su such that having some bioinformatics expertise. Um, kind of on the team, so to speak, would be helpful. Um, and the people to talk to about that would be um, the guys in the lab. So uh, our lab director, Dan Freed, um, and then uh, one of our scientists, Nindo Pintori. And, and um, we could connect offline. I could connect you with them. Uh, I'm sure they would appreciate, uh, you know, the help, or at least, you know, having a conversation to see what's possible. Um, so yeah, just you could email us at support at cordomo.org and we'll get you connected to them. Um, on the question of AI, this is a really, I'd say interesting and exciting question. So the ramifications and potential applications are big and wide and have the potential to uh, kind of apply to lots of different aspects of our work. So at the most basic level, um, you know, like within a few weeks, we were using it just for our internal operations to um, try to drive efficiencies internally. And Sarah, our chief of staff, has really been leading the charge there. Um, and I think there's a lot more potential uh, on that front. But I think your question was around drug discovery specifically. So there have been companies and academic groups that have been using generative AI to aid in drug discovery for a long time now. It's just that in the last two years or so, and really in the last year, some of the models and, and approaches have um, reached a critical mass, I guess, to use a, a colloquial term. Um, they've, they've gotten you know, good enough that now there's, I, th I think we're 
I think we're starting to see um, some really exciting outputs that kind of match the excitement that we're hearing about publicly in the last you know nine months or so. But there's there's like hundreds of academic groups and companies that are are doing are working with generative AI and drug discovery. It's not like there's just a handful that are leading the pack. There's I mean there's hundreds of them. If you look at there's like companies that have done landscape analyses, and I mean it's almost too numerous to count at this point. Um, and some of you know some of them are using off the shelf models, and some of them are I mean there's a lot of like lots of different variation. Um, and so maybe maybe you're aware of this, but Specifically, how does this apply to Cordoma? So some of these approaches are being employed to um, predict new uses for existing drugs based upon mining the literature and um, you know ingesting lots of different data and saying it looks like maybe this you know drug that was developed for some other disease could be used for Cordoma. Um, and that's a, an approach that's been applied already to Cordoma as well as to other tumor types. Um, the other exciting approach is to use generative AI to model or to kind of design new drugs that don't exist yet to interact with a protein of interest. And in this case, the relevant protein is Brachyuri. So can an AI help us design? There's a uh, work from the Baker Lab at Washington uh, on this open source tool called RF Diffusion to design de novo proteins. So yeah, uh, there is, and uh, every day uh, there's a bunch of commercial companies in this space, but yeah, I, I am excited. I'm, I'm in academia, so I'm, uh, but based in India and uh, interested in this space. And very yeah. quickly, uh, I don't, uh, I bet, uh, so quick, uh, uh, your answer prompted, you know, also, on the patient side, right? Uh, you know, somebody who's just been diagnosed with cordoma or is wondering about it could be like if you could fine tune what chat GPT is on cordoma uh, literature that exists online, right? I imagine rather than doing a hundred uh, Google and WebMD searches, if you could have like a conversational agent which could counsel and possibly empathize with you, uh, you know, it could be a great assistant. Uh, or like a, like a, yeah, you know, like a virtual friend of some sort. It, it's a, I, I love the, it's, it's something that we have talked about internally. Um, so, I mean, right now our patient navigators serve in a very similar capacity, but could this augment their work? Um, might there be a kind of a, a let's call it a self-service level? Um, I think if you're really careful though, when dealing with, um, patient interaction because chat GPT it can hallucinate. Exactly. exactly. I mean, just as an example, like the, the day after chat GPT was launched, we just experimented with it. And we, you know, we asked it some questions as though we were court of patients looking for advice. And, you know, we were really happy that it recommended contacting the Cordoma foundation but it made up a phone number. It just like out of thin air made up a phone number for us. Um, and so that's like, you know, the risk of that is not insignificant. Um, so, so I think we have to proceed with caution, but definitely there's potential there. And I think we have to balance like the, to what extent we get involved in kind of piloting new technologies or technology development versus letting technologies mature and then utilize utilizing more off the shelf tools, I, I can say, I mean, it's almost certain that what you're describing will eventually be developed. Um, and, and I think it's just a question of, you know, are we going to be on among the, those that are piloting or beta testing it? Or are we going to wait for others to do that? Um, and I, I think, I think it's an open question, but going back to the issue of generative AI in, in drug or, or kind of drug design, drug discovery. So a couple of exciting things that are going on right now, there's several different companies like AI enabled companies that we're working with um, that are doing either generative design or virtual screens uh, against Brachyuri. And that work is starting to bear some fruit, but- Could you name a few? Not yet. Or we're maybe. under confidential okay. obligations with them. Um, but, um, but what we've realized is that 
the number of potential approaches is so numerous or potential entities, whether companies or academic investigators, is so numerous that we there's no way that we could select, uh, you know, we're not, we're not so smart to be able to select the very best. Obviously, we're going to try, but we also need to leave open the possibility that there's groups out there that we haven't heard of that are in stealth mode that, you know, for whatever reason, their capabilities are not, you know, fully apparent, whatever. And we need to be able to signal to those uh, investigators or companies that Bracteria is an important target that it's worthwhile to work on. And one of the things that we are hoping to be able to do and, and making plans for is to, you can imagine a prize to kind of try to stimulate or incentivize various groups to work on this target. And the initial screening or the initial um, kind of hit finding is not tremendously costly or laborious. Obviously there's compute time, there's some personnel time, but it's not, hundreds of thousands of dollars is probably in the tens of thousands of dollars. And so, if, you know, you had a prize of sufficient, or provided a sufficient incentive, you could imagine a, a number of groups trying their hand at it. And we're, we're inspired by uh, a similar effort that's been, that's been spearheaded by the Structural Genomics Consortium. They've got a prize to try to discover uh, chemical to tools or probes for some, for difficult targets. And also our own experience with the prize, um, some may be aware that early on in the Cordoma Foundation's journey, a huge rate limiting factor for research was access to cell lines. So there are all these ideas and people were interested in studying the disease, but we couldn't get, no one could get access to the cell lines and, and that needed to be overcome. And we funded a number of groups to try to do that, mostly unsuccessfully. Um, but then we said, similarly, let's see if we get a lot of people to try their hand at it and might someone get lucky. And, and, and so we offered a prize and sure enough, it, it worked to stimulate a lot of different groups to try and some groups succeeded. And then because I think the important thing is because we didn't limit the prize to just one group, we, we said, okay, anyone who developed a cell line is going to get the prize. It eliminated a potential disincentive to sharing what people learned along the way. And so you had groups that succeeded at first sharing how they did it. And then other groups you know, building on that. And so now we've solved that problem. There's 26 Cordoma cell lines. So hopefully we can do the same thing with, uh, with, with brachyuri drugs that, or excuse me, with brachyuri, at least, you know, uh, tools or, or, or chemical probes. But uh, the final thing I'll say on that is that, so this is an idea we've had for, I don't know, a year or so, but the, there's two things that have been missing. Number one has been funding and thankfully we've solved that. So we've got funding to do this now. Um, but the second thing that's been missing is the capability to easily adjudicate the prize, like determine whether the compounds that people find are doing what they need to do. Um, but now we're very, very, so we, through the lab, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've kind of set up a series of tests to be able to evaluate emerging brachyuri therapeutics. And we're kind of midway through developing the, the toolbox that we need, but we're close enough that we're, I think, in the next couple of months, going to probably go forward with um, with offering this, which, which I, I'm, I'm is one of the things I'm most excited about right now. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Boaz. <clears throat> Hi, Josh. Hi. First, uh, Good to see you on uh, video. Thank you. First, uh, joining uh, the others to complicate to. Uh, the regards you got, uh, all the important job you do. Uh, what I wanted to ask, unfortunately, my uh, codoma, like, after the, uh, I was diagnosed uh, like uh, like uh, nine years ago, seven years later, it became uh, leptomeningiali. And uh, now we are considering maybe to treat it with the same drugs we we, we used to do, uh, it's include the uh, nivolumab, uh, avastin, elvitux, and chemo, but uh, try to do it uh, with direct delivery to the CSF. And uh, I was trying to look for some information about this, couldn't find, and I don't know, maybe you, other people here, have any 
experience or no about using this uh, uh, this uh, kind of delivery. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear about the leptomeningeal spread. Um, I think that it is unfortunately a, uh, I mean, it's not very common, but it's also not super uncommon. Um, so to my knowledge, there, I'm, I'm not aware of the kind of standard repertoire of chordoma systemic therapies being used intrathecally. I think that would have, that would be a discussion to have with an experienced medical oncologist, really not something I can comment on. However, there is a very, very interesting anecdote. And so I want to like very heavily caveat this, that this is a single patient. Um, but there's a, there's a clinical trial that was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering a number of years ago um, with a um, intrathecally delivered uh, radionuclide. So basically an antibody attached to a radioisotope that delivered um, uh, radiation specifically to tumor cells within the CNS. And there was one chronoma patient that went on this trial. And I believe that was more than 10 years ago. The patient had obviously advanced disease and has been completely stable for the last 10 plus years. Um, it's kind of buried within like a table within this publication. Um, and Shannon, maybe we can, uh, I don't know if you have that that paper handy, but maybe we can we can put it in the chat. Um, so it's an N of one, impossible to know whether it would be beneficial for others. Um, we've taken it to our medical advisory board and they kind of didn't know what to do with it because it was just an N of one. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, I believe, uh, I believe that the company last year maybe, or the year before tried applied for FDA approval and was not granted FDA approval for the, the indication that they were trying to gain approval for. And again, don't quote me on this. I think it might've been neuroblastoma. So maybe Shannon can pull up the paper and I'll, I'll test my memory here, but um, but certainly we'll follow up. Um, and, and I don't know what the status is as far as availability of that drug. Is it available on compassionate use? Is it available in a clinical trial right now? But we'll We'll follow up with you and, and try to get that information to you. Thank you. Uh, another question, if I can. Uh, I remember a few months ago, you reported about uh, uh, Erbitux as uh, maybe some promising agent uh, in the lab. Is any is it new for you? any new information about it? Yeah, so, so the... The uh, the kind of generic name being cetuximab. Um, yeah. Yeah. So very promising data in mice. So among the eighty plus drugs that have been tested, this cetuximab is kind of top two or three in terms of efficacy in mice. And what that means is, in almost all the mice mouse models in which it's been tested, um, there is significant tumor growth inhibition in a subset it's complete tumor growth inhibition. And then in a, a further subset, there's actually regression. So based upon that, there's a clinical trial that's ongoing at MD Anderson. They um, started that trial last year. Uh, the way it's structured is it's, a, it's broken into two stages. The first stage was 10 patients. If there was one response on the 10 patients, and by response, I mean tumor shrinkage, not just growth reduction. There's one response, then they would go on to an additional 19 patients. And um, what we can say is that there was at least one response. So one tumor, at least one tumor that shrunk in that first stage, and they've gone on now to an, enroll an additional 19 patients. And they're, um, they've kind of just gotten started on that second stage. Um, and there was a number of gating factors, one of which was funding. And thankfully, we've just recently raised the funds to be able to support that second stage and actually just recently awarded the grant. So, um, so they're off to the races now and rolling more patients. And 
I think we'll we'll have more answers probably end of this year or into next year. But I think what we can say is that anecdotally, there are some responses that we've heard of. But the reason it's important to do the trial is, okay, is, is the denominator 10 or is the denominator 100? Um, you know, one or five, you know, one out of five or one out of 10 would be pretty good as cancer drugs go. One out of 100 would be not so, um, you know, not so noteworthy. But I would say it's worth talking with an oncologist about the possibility of cetuximab. There's another, so cetuximab is intravenous. Um, it's an antibody. You have to go into clinic regularly to receive it. There's another class of drugs that hit the same target. So cetuximab is an antibody. There's small molecules that, excuse me, target the same protein EGFR. And the drugs in that category would be um, erlotinib or a fatinib. A fatinib among EGFR inhibitors seems to be um, the most active preclinically, and there's a clinical trial ongoing, or actually, excuse me, just finished enrollment and we're awaiting results. So I don't know. It's, um, it's, it's too soon to say that these are definitely active drugs, but on the other hand, there's a kind of a growing body of anecdotal evidence and certainly very strong preclinical evidence that points to these drugs being active in cordoma. And so, uh, again, wor worth talking with uh, a clinician about, about, you know, cetuximab or, and or a fatinib. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. I, I want to, uh, I want to address this. There's a couple of people who have questions, uh, in the chat. They're maybe having difficulty raising their hands. Um, Oh, okay. It was uh, Hossein. Okay, that's you. So uh, you've got your hand raised now. Hi, Hossein. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Josh. This is my first time, and um, uh, I appreciate what you guys are doing, uh, and especially Cordoma uh, Foundation are doing a great job. They're the one who actually uh, got me um, familiar with the, with the whole system and finding uh, a source for a surgery for my son. Now, giving you a little bit of a background history, my son was diagnosed with the cordoma, uh, extra axial cordoma in um, February 2022. Um, uh, Making a long story short, he had some symptoms in January 2022, uh, swallowing uh, a, a juice with a with the uh, uh, with a straw, and then I, subsequently he followed up with an X-ray a scan, and then uh, infused. Uh, biopsy, and then, uh, and then finally, we had to be referred to a cardiothoracic surgeon, who told us that, and since they could not find uh, the exact uh, uh, problem, they, uh, he was, uh, he said he's going to go and open him up from the left side, uh, because uh, the tumor was uh, actually located uh, by trachea, a trachea uh, uh, section of his, between his throat and his lung. And it was, was still on the soft tissue. So he told us that he's going to either uh, remove the whole thing, or if they find out that based on the pathology they will do during the, uh, the procedure, that if he's something uh, more serious, then he's not going to touch it. But afterward, we found out that he took a big chunk of it. Um, and he said, you know, we, I had, you know, he didn't even tell us that he was going to do that. But then he, they said they would uh, they send it to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota for uh, further analysis. Waiting for two, three weeks, they finally they told us it was uh, um, uh, extra axial cortoma and they found a brachyury and uh, his uh, blood test. Um, and then based on the research, we were told that it was slow growing tumor. So uh, my son was trying to take his time, uh, do some research and do some uh, natural remedy to see if we could stop it by any chances. Uh, however, um, he followed up with the doctors uh, um, in Mayo to go through some um, um, uh, proton beam therapy, 35 sessions. And he was told that if he only does that, he has a 50% chance of survival or uh, having the cordoma to uh, recur. But if he subsequently followed that by a surgery, then it is 85% that uh, the cordoma would never, uh, would never grow back. So. Uh, this January, he went through the surgery, 
and uh, he was caught like four places. They found out that uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the biopsy that the cardiothoracic surgeon did, the, there was a few other places like in his lung and uh, on his rib, uh, there were a spine of the tumor. So they had to remove that, shave his rib. And also uh, the tumor had grown drastically very long up to five by four by four and then also affected some of his vertebrates. So they had to remove one vertebrate and shave another one. Mm. So it was a very, very uh, invasive mm. surgery. But surprisingly afterward, uh, the doctor, which was very good doc, doctor, Dr. Rose in Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, he did an excellent job. Um, but he was, uh, the, my, my son was told that now he has to go through uh, chemotherapy right after. And we were surprised and he was trying, to, he's still trying to avoid that part. So we were trying to find other sources. And then there's a one place, one clinic that, that are located in LA that he's doing some immunotherapy treatment there. It doesn't seem like he's working. My son is trying to not think about it and he's trying to avoid this by being positive. And uh, I'm devastated, I don't know what to do. I uh, trying to find some other remedies so he because he doesn't want to go to the uh, follow the, the chemo and this immunotherapy it doesn't look like is really uh, effective so um, I don't know if this is the right question to ask you but I think it is in a way that what do you suggest is there any other way there is any it would be in a good candidate for you whatever you guys are doing to try to a new drug on the bracuri for yeah. him because he was just trying to do a trial and error and is not uh, his i don't want to waste i mean i don't want to lose time and yeah. uh, i want to be positive he's positive but at the same time he's 30 years old mm. and um i'm trying to see if there are any options that you could take right now at this time i'm so i'm so sorry for what he's gone through what, what he's going through what you're going through um it's a tough situation. Uh, so I guess the first thing is that extra axial cordoma is really, really rare as I mean, rare among rare. And so the standard approaches, standard numbers that get thrown around, those are based upon skull base and spine cordomas, but there's so little data and experience with respect to extra axial cordoma to you know, to kind of be able to prognosticate or it's, it's just, there's so much variability there. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is once the tumor has, is beyond the local disease. So surgery and radiation are, can be quite good at controlling local disease, like the primary tumor and perhaps a, a, you know, an adjacent or kind of localized recurrence. But once the tumor has spread to other locations, you mentioned the rib and other vertebral bodies, et cetera, then surgery and radiation, their role switches. It's very different. They're, they're not going to be curative. Um, the role for surgery and radiation in those instances is to either um, alleviate symptoms or to enable other therapeutic approaches. So for example, surgery might be used to debulk a tumor such that it can be radiated, or maybe surgery is, um, you know, if warranted as a means of obtaining tumor tissue um, to e explore whether there's any features of the tumor that could point to a personalized uh, drug therapy. That I think is important to, it's important to note that the likelihood of that happening is very, very low. Um, but it is possible. So sometimes there's some aspect of an individual's tumor, specifically some uh, gene that's altered or, or protein that's expressed or not expressed that could make that tumor likely sensitive to a drug that already exists. <clears throat> so I think that's one thing to be aware of and consider is that if, there's a, if it's possible to get a biopsy, or if there's recently resected tumor tissue, there's molecular profiling of the tumor that could be done that has a chance, albeit a low probability chance of leading to a therapy that could make, you know, that could be really well suited for your son. 
if that doesn't work, and again, I don't want to overpromise. I think the the it's more likely than not that that will not, not work. But if but and so if it doesn't, then um, there are a number of other systemic therapy options, either off label that could be considered or on clinical trials, and whether it makes sense for him to go on a clinical trial or to pursue an off-label therapy, that's very much an individualized uh, decision-making calculus. It depends upon uh, whether he would be eligible for some of the clinical trials. It depends upon his ability to tolerate. So, you know, what is his um, physical ability? Some of the clinical trials require a certain level of physical ability to be able to enter um, willingness to travel, et cetera. Furthermore, the, um, some of the clinical trials, there's like an, an, a window of opportunity that arises and it can be such that it's only open, it's only enrolling patients for a narrow window of opportunity and that could change week to week. So you can look on our website and Shannon can maybe put in the, in the chat, we have a list of all of the systemic therapies all the drug therapies for which there is strong or for which there is scientific rationale to consider them for Cordoma. Some are available on clinical trials, some are available off label, but it's really difficult. And I think maybe not so advisable to try to navigate that on your own. The most important thing is to find a medical oncologist who really knows Cordoma and who is going to advocate and be dogged on behalf of your son. And we can, if you connect with um, our patient navigators, we can share some names and institutions where those medical oncologists uh, are. Um, but I think just to throw out some, um, you know, potentials, Mass General, um, MD Anderson, Certainly the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so if he's treated at the Mayo Clinic, there are oncologists, uh, medical oncologists there who, who know Cordoma and have treated a lot of Cordoma patients. So I think you're in good hands there, but um, it can't help, it can't hurt to get a second or third opinion. Um, you know, also I should say Sloan Kettering. You mentioned Los Angeles. There's a medical oncologist in Southern California, uh, Dr. Kayseri, um, who has, has run a clinical trial for Cordoma with a drug called Pemetrexid and treats quite a number of patients. So there's, there's good options. There's, there, are, there are quite experienced uh, and, and knowledgeable medical oncologists that can help guide your son through his next steps. But as far as avoiding drug therapy at this point, that's a question for his doctors. But I think from everything that I know, it's it's probably very unlikely that 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 there is an option other than drug therapy or systemic therapy at this point. Um, now, people use the term chemotherapy interchangeably with drug therapy or systemic therapy. Chemotherapy, in a more technical sense, refers to a subset of cancer drugs um, that historically have been associated with pretty significant side effects that people associate, you know, vomiting, hair loss, et cetera. For the most part, the drugs that are used, that are being used to treat Cordoma patients don't fall into that category. There, there are targeted therapies. And certainly there are side effects, but in some cases, those side effects are very manageable, if not minimal. In fact, um, you know, we're, Shannon, speaks with, and I, we are in contact with quite a number of patients who have been on various systemic therapies with minimal side effects for years. So I, I think it's important to, to know that the side effect profile is going to vary by drug and it's going to vary by individual. And your son has every right to share with his oncologist that he's either willing or unwilling to tolerate certain side effects. And that might rule out certain drugs but there might be a subset of drugs that could be tried that would be expected to not have side effects that he would find intolerable. So I think it doesn't necessarily have to be a binary decision of systemic therapy or no systemic therapy. It could be that there's a variety of systemic therapy options that exist, some of which he might find palatable and some of which might be less palatable. And it's just a matter of having 
a kind of a detailed conversation with an experienced medical oncologist to help guide him to an appropriate decision. Thank you. I appreciate your feedback. Absolutely. John, good to see you. Mr. Summers, how you doing, bud? You look great rocking that beard. Oh, you too. Thank you. Uh, happy, happy belated Father's Day, too. Like, yeah, thank you. Uh, likewise. Hey, some some just quick questions uh, regarding uh, not necessarily the direct relationship of chordoma to a patient, but but more towards uh, siblings. You know, uh, Chuck's uh, sister Chrissy. I, I often wonder: Is there any evidence that the foundation has seen that there is a genetic connection associated with chordoma and either siblings or or their their children? It's a really good question. Um, I would say the bottom line is it is exceedingly unlikely that a sibling would be at risk. That's the simple answer. <laughs> the slightly more in-depth answer is that uh, there are several known genetic predispositions to chordoma, uh, and we can take them one at a time. One of them is what's called familial chordoma. And that is where there is a cluster of chordoma within a family. So multiple members affected to be parent, child, et cetera. In that instance, basically any blood relative of those two or more individuals would likely be at pretty significantly elevated risk. Um, the number of families that have been reported that truly have familial chordoma is about 10 in the entire world throughout all of history. So, I mean, rare among rare. Um, so I think that from a practical standpoint, for 99.9% .9 of chordoma patients, there should be no worry whatsoever about a sibling being at risk or a, a child being at risk. If you've had a blood relative with chordoma or suspected, you know, something that could be chordoma. So like some of these families have actually, it's turned out that a, a relative decades ago died of a, you know, unknown spine tumor. Um, and, you know, it turned out to be chordoma. So if there's any concern whatsoever about the possibility of familial chordoma, then the place to go is the National Cancer Institute. There's a familial chordoma study and maybe we could put that in the in the chat. Um, and they have been really systematically studying these families. Um, at least four of the, those families, we know what the cause is. And interestingly enough, it turns out to be a change in the brachyuri gene. So those fam specifically those families, the individuals who are affected, they have an extra copy of the Brachyuri gene, whereas normally everyone would carry two copies of the Brachyuri gene, one from your father, one from your mother. For some unknown reason, um, these uh, families have three copies. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, pretty much anyone in those families who had those three copies ended up getting chordoma. So it's a pretty high likelihood. I mean, almost certainty if you have that gene duplication, you're gonna get chordoma. But we're talking about uh, 50 people in the entire world in all of history. So it's very, very, very rare, very uncommon. Okay, that sometimes gets confused with another genetic predisposition that also involves brachyuri. Uh, so let's say 50 people in the entire world, roughly speaking, have this, maybe even less, have this extra copy of the Brachyuri gene. It also turns out that there's another change in the Brachyuri gene that predisposes to Cordoma, and that is much more ubiquitous. So there's, within the population, uh, there are lots of different like versions or flavors or spellings of the same gene. In the case of Brachyuri, 
there's four or five different variants, if you will, that are that are relatively common throughout the world. And they vary in how common they are based upon where in the world they are, Africa, Asia, you know, Europe, et cetera. There is a one of these versions of Breck theory that is most common within uh, people of Caucasian descent. Um, uh, so about 50% of people of Caucasian descent have this particular variation of the Brachieri gene. And it seems like that version of Brachieri is a necessity for, for Cordoma to get going. So if you don't have this version of the Brachieri gene, you seem to not get Cordoma. However, something like 50% of the Caucasian population, maybe 30 or 40% of people of Asian descent, less than 10% of people of African descent have this particular version of the Brachieri gene. And what that means is that it, you can't really use that to predict whether you're gonna get Cordoma because still, even if you have it, your risk of getting Cordoma, rather than being uh, you know, one in a million, it's two in a million. So you know, you're still more likely to get struck by lightning. Um, but it could be a little bit confusing because people hear about, oh, there's this connection to Brachieri, this, alteration, the SNP, am I at risk? The answer still, even if you have that alteration, the, the risk of having it, of getting Cordoma or of a sibling or a child getting Cordoma is, I mean, it's one, two in a million, it's vanishingly small. Okay, so that covers almost everything. And then there's a couple other tumor predisposition syndromes. And I won't mention all of them, but the most notable is tuberous sclerosis. And so this is a, it's, a, it's more common than Cordoma. Um, I don't know exactly what the incidence is. Maybe it's one in, I'm, I'm guessing here, but it's, you know, it's, rather than one in a million, maybe it's one in 10,000 or something, or one in 100,000. Um, and there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's two different genes that are, can be altered that lead to developing tuberous sclerosis. And, the manifestation of tuberous sclerosis is uh, a certain type of kidney tumor, a certain type of brain tumor, a couple other tumor types. Uh, in some cases, developmental delays or um, you know, uh, kind of a cognitive impairment, uh, and then rarely chordoma as well. But almost always, that shows up when that's been reported. That's shown up in young children. Um, I don't know of any cases of Cordoma being diagnosed in a patient with tuberous sclerosis after young, yeah, early childhood. Okay. That was a very long way of answering your question. I wanted to be thorough, but the, I think, again, just to reiterate, very, very, very low risk to siblings or relatives. Well, thank you for that, Josh. The, uh, I'll, I'll sleep better just as a father. Um, and I just want to end by saying thank you so much for everything that you and your team do. You are truly a godsend to that rare uh, cancer community. Keep, well, keep up the good work. We are all in this together. I mean, truly, we are all in this together. And none of this would be possible without the support of many, many people in this community. And, you know, John, you are, uh, you have been such an incredibly dedicated supporter. I mean, we, um, we never, we never wish Cordoma on anyone, but, um, you know, when, when people like you enter our community and you know others on this call as well, it's it, it, that that is a godsend for us. So so thank you. Um, I just want to mention we're past time here, but there's really no hard stop, so we can keep going. Please don't feel that you know any any need to hold back on questions. We have basically unlimited time. Uh, Sarah has raised her hand. Hi, Sarah. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. I just wanted to pass along to you, Josh, a question that came into me via chat. Could you just briefly address uh, what's new in pediatric Cordoma research and where you see that going next with the foundation's work? Yeah, absolutely. So this has been an area of particular interest and uh, of, of import for us for the last five or six years now. I mean, obviously important um, you know, always, but in particular uh, of late. Um, and that is largely thanks to a couple of things. First of all, uh, uh, several really dedicated families, um, you know, putting resources behind pediatric Kodama research, as well as some very dedicated um, 
clinicians who have really made this uh, a focus. So what's new? Um, a couple of big things. I, I mentioned earlier on that research was hamstrung in general for Cordoma for a long time because we didn't have access to cell lines. We didn't have access to animal models. That was very much true for pediatric Cordoma. And we kind of solved the problem for, uh, and, and not, not intentionally, but just happenstantially, this problem was solved or kind of got on the way to being solved for adult Cordoma first. But thanks to investments that have been made over the last five or six years, we now have quite a number of pediatric Cordoma cell lines and pediatric Cordoma mouse models. And what that means is now, um, and tissue samples. And so um, increasingly pediatric Cordoma from a, a preclinical research perspective is now on more equal footing with adult Cordoma. And, um, and we are making every effort to include pediatric Cordoma models in the work in, in the preclinical research that's being done, whether it be work by our grantees or whether it be work that we're doing in uh, the Cordoma Foundation's lab. Um, and so pretty much almost every drug or, or at, you know, the, at least the majority of drugs that we're testing in mice now um, are being tested in at least one pediatric Cordoma model. Sometimes it doesn't make sense for various reasons. Uh, or it's impractical, but by and large, we're, we're trying to test as many drugs as possible in pediatric models. Um, that's on the kind of preclinical side of things. On the uh, basic biology front, there's been a fundamental question as to whether pediatric cordoma is fundamentally different from a biological perspective from adult cordoma. And there's been some hints that maybe it is but we haven't nailed that down definitively. There's several projects that we've supported over the years. Some, you know, kind of at, at various stages of maturation, some are wrapping up and some are ongoing that are seeking to answer that question. And I would say for better or worse, it's still inconclusive. I would say that, you know, the better side of that equation is, it seems like a lot of aspects of pediatric cordoma are shared in common with adult cordoma. And that's great because that means that pediatric that children could potentially benefit from the same therapies that adults might benefit from. Um, but there's still some. Um, I would say that the, the, the jury is still out. There's st you know we don't we have not. I would say learned enough to say that conclusively, and um, you know, conclusively that uh, that you know they're biologically similar enough to treat them basically the same. Um, and I would say that there is some interesting data that's going to be presented at our upcoming research workshop about um, some genetic features of pediatric cordoma that might actually be, you know, um, pretty unique. So, uh, I, I, you know, a, a story that is is um, still unfolding there. Um, I guess a subset of that story in terms of the uniqueness or the difference of pediatric cordoma versus adult cordoma. One thing that is pretty clear is that there is a, a kind of genetic subtype of cordoma that is enriched significantly in the pediatric and young adult population. And that is the poorly differentiated subtype. So many of you may have heard of that. Um, poorly differentiated cordoma is almost always associated, not always, but almost always associated with a particular genetic change, which is loss of a particular gene and then the protein that that gene produces called INI1, also called uh, SMARCB1. And, um, and so individuals who lose that gene and then the corresponding protein, um, their tumors, they behave somewhat differently. They tend to be more aggressive. Um, so the prognosis tends to be worse. Um, the flip side is they also tend to be more responsive to a variety of different drugs, both preclinically and there's limited data showing that they're more responsive to various drugs in the clinic as well. And those drugs include um, a drug called tazemetostat, which is um, uh, what's called an EZH2 inhibitor, and perhaps also uh, checkpoint inhibitors, which is a, a class of immune therapies. And, and maybe maybe chemotherapies um, as well. So for children, or really anyone under uh, you know young adult and below, um, 
and you know, young adult is a maybe imprecise cut point, but you know, some people say it's 30 or 35 or 40 or to be honest, Janet, I can't actually remember what the consensus guidelines said, but basically, um, you know, if you're a young adult or a child with cordoma, it's pretty important to check to really be sure whether the tumor is poorly differentiated or whether it has loss of INI1 because that could pretty significantly change the treatment course. Um, and, and then, you know, what, what have we learned recently? What's happened recently? Where are we going in the future? Um, so one thing that was pretty interesting recently, there's a group from Mass General that just published a pretty, like the largest pediatric uh, data set uh, patients treated over many years with proton beam radiation. Um, and I think largely it confirms what we've known, which is that proton beam radiation can be quite effective, but it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a cure-all. It's, you know, there's a lot of patients who uh, eventually recur and who need other, you know, who, who, who go on to need other therapies. Um, I think another interesting thing was that there are not a significant number of late effects from that radiation. And so to the earlier question of, could we combine surgery or, or radiation with a systemic therapy or either perhaps obviate the need for radiation and might that help patients um, you know, avoid some of the late effects of radiation. That's, I think, an interesting area of research. Um, another thing that's worth noting is that there is a big effort that's gotten underway, and we're really grateful for it um, at the National Cancer Institute, led by a group of investigators within the pediatric oncology branch at the National Cancer Institute. But I should say it's not limited just to pediatric cordoma, even though that is a, a main area of interest. They have set up a natural history study, which is tracking Cordoma patients over many years and gathering their medical records from multiple different institutions and really studying their cases in great detail to try to better characterize, you know, what is the range of outcomes for, children, for people with Cordoma, what therapies are associated with better or worse outcomes, et cetera. So I think there's a lot to be learned from that study. There's all, they're also pairing it with some um, molecular and genetic analysis, uh, analyses. Um, and again, that's not limited just to pediatric cordoma, but it is enriched for pediatric cordoma. And, um, and they'll also be presenting at the, at the upcoming research workshop as well as the upcoming community conference. So um, if anyone is planning on attending it, I, I very much hope to see uh, some of you there. You'll hear from uh, some of those, the investigators that are running this um, the study at the NCI. Um, our hope is that, well, I guess the final thing I'll say on this, our hope is that in the not too distant future, there will be clinical trials that are available to pediatric cordoma patients. Um, there's a number of challenges with that. Um, you know, pe pediatric oncology is a, is a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a defined subspecialty. It's a defined field different from adult oncology. And the treatment protocols are different. The doctors that treat, can treat pediatric patients are different. The risk tolerance um, is different. The way companies approach pediatric patients is different. So it's it's a whole other can of worms. And the, you know, it, it, it's important, but we also need to make sure that we're not um, kind of racing into them, into clinical trials uh, without a really good justification. Um, to justify the potential uh, potential risk. So there's more, there's basically more preclinical work and there's more work from a natural history perspective that needs to be done before a clinical trial can happen for pediatric cordoma. I guess the, and if I had to guess or kind of prognosticate or hypothesize which, which therapies might be tested in pediatric cordoma patients, it's probably going to be a therapy that's demonstrated effectiveness in the adult population and also demonstrated effectiveness in pediatric models of the disease. So you might take, for example, cetuximab. Let's say that trial is, yields a positive result in patients, and we're seeing that the drug is having the same effect in adult and pediatric models. Will it make a lot of sense to move forward with a clinical trial in, in pediatric cordoma patients? And, and I think the, for the additional reason that I believe, although I'm not 100% sure about this, that um, 
So tuximab, there is a known safe dose in patients at least down to a certain age. I don't know what that is, but that's another thing that has to be kept in mind is that not all cancer drugs are, we don't necessarily off, out, out of the gate know what the safe dose is for pediatric patients. And to have to do a dose finding study or a, you know, a safety study would, would add complexity and risk and time and cost, et cetera. So hopefully it would be a drug where there's a known safety profile in pediatric patients and uh, a kind of a known, a known dosing regimen, et cetera. Um, so probably more that could be said about that, but maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and invite any additional questions. Yeah, Richard. Oh, oh, Kathleen, we'll get to you next. I'm sorry, I know you've been trying to raise your hand. I'll, I'll make sure to call you next. Uh, sorry, man, just a quick question. Uh, when I had, I had sacral surgery, now the possibility of nerve regeneration to get maybe try to get foot, my functions back, like, uh, you know, is, is that possible? I mean, or is there any way, is there any research in that? Uh, nerve regeneration and stuff? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I think the short answer is um, it's still very experimental early days and for a long time had been considered impossible. But there's some pioneering surgeons that are um, trying to solve this problem. I'm not remembering their names off the top of my head, Shannon might, uh, but certainly we could put you in touch with them. And they, uh, for example, are trying to um, kind of uh, reestablish, uh, um, you know, uh, bowel bladder or sexual function, um, things of that nature. I, I you know, I, I think it's it's still early days, and it's not. Um, a home run yet, but I think there's enough from what from what we've heard. I think there's enough promise that it's it'd be worth exploring at this point. I, Shannon, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. You might be more aware than I am, actually. Yeah, there. So, Dr. Justin Brown at Mass General is one of the surgeons who is is working on this, and um, they have been successful with function and mobility in upper extremities. So movement of arms and hands. Um, and they're working now, they're doing studies in animals for uh, bladder control. And so I, I think that, um, as Josh said, it's, it's, um, it's still kind of on the horizon, but I, I do get the impression that within the next few years, they'd like to start clinical trials in humans. Um, for the bladder and uh, possibly bowel control as well. I'll put a link in the chat to um, a webinar that Dr. Brown spoke at um, a couple years ago with us so that uh, people can learn more about that if you'd like. Um, and then of course you can contact me if you wanna hear any more about it. Well, Kathleen, good to see you. Thanks. I'm very low tech, so I had to raise my hand. Um, I was wondering, um, with the Hermie vaccine at MGH, what's happening with that beyond M MGH? And um, I was part of it, actually. And then I'm wondering, um, is it still promising? And how long does it kind of take for immunotherapy to start? Have you seen? And then I had a different question after, if I could, please. Yeah, absolutely. So that trial now is open at a number of sites. Um, gosh, Senator, it's probably five or six sites now. Okay. Um, excuse me. It um, took a while for it to open up at all the different sites, but they're, I think as far as we're aware, they are still accruing patients. Shannon, have you heard anything different? No. Yeah, still open. Yeah, they're, they're still accruing patients. We don't have the results yet. Um, so for kind of historical context, that is the, I believe the fourth Brachyuri vaccine that has been tried in Cordoma. Each of the three previous ones have, have demonstrated, I would say, non-zero, but also not super impressive uh, results or activity. And so it's been promising enough that 
companies have been willing to invest in further clinical trials and you know the the IRBs have been willing to approve those trials and our medical advisory board has endorsed those trials but we haven't heard of any home runs yet um, despite the initial optimism and what does that tell us that tells and I would say not only despite the initial optimism but despite the fact that we know that these vaccines do what they need to do to the immune system. They generate, they stimulate the immune system to generate a response against the tumor. It appears, however, that that alone is insufficient, that the, the immune system is not able to finish the job. It's not able to actually destroy the tumors. So that raises some really interesting questions. What is it about the tumors that is rebuffing the immune response? Um, why are the tumors resistant? And uh, this is a question that exists not just for Cordoma, but for solid tumors of all types. There's a huge area of active research, but I think one that is very, very important to get to the bottom of for Cordoma, and we're currently funding several projects to try to answer that question. Um, there's a project at Mass, uh, excuse me, at Northwestern. There's a project we're supporting at NYU. Um, and, and, um, and there's work that's gone on at the National Cancer Institute, Johns Hopkins, there's a project in France, et cetera. Um, and there's more work to be done there, more work we'd like to support. Um, we've, 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 we have a really fruitful partnership with, it's called Cancer, uh, the Cancer Research Institute, CRI. They are the largest funder of uh, cancer immunology and immunotherapy research. And they have, you know, they're, they're networked with every, um, you know, cancer immunologist. Um, and so we've, we have a really fruitful partnership where we co-fund grants with them and we, um, we benefit from their network and from their uh, expert peer reviewers, which include um, uh, Nobel laureates and you know, members of the National Academies, et cetera. Um, and, and so we funded, I think, four projects together and there's several more that were, are currently under review. Anyway, that's just a long way of saying there's more work that is ongoing and more work that needs to be done to understand how tum cordoma tumors interact with the immune system and what could be done to make cordoma tumors more susceptible to immune response. Because you can imagine combining the brachyuri vaccines with one or more therapies that kind of breaks down the tumor's defenses and then enables the immune cells that have been primed by the vaccine to, to do their job or to complete the job. Um, and so if I had to guess, I would say probably the net, you know, assuming there's still appetite among the companies and uh, medical advisory board still thinks it makes sense, probably the next step would be a rational combination with one of those uh, vaccines and, uh, you know, some other therapy that could prime the tumor to, or, or kind of make the tumor more vulnerable to the immune response that the vaccines are generating. Okay, and then while you're speaking earlier, you had said you had mentioned cetuximab, and you said that was like in the top two or three. Um, what were the other ones, or what were you referring to when you said top two or three clinical trials? What did you mean? What are the other two or three? Yeah, so what I was referring to is uh, top top few drugs that have shown activity in mouse models of cordoma. Okay. Um, the others being a fatnib. Um, another drug uh, called gemcitabine. Um, so afatinib and, and cetuximab are both EGFR inhibitors. Gemcitabine is a, um, it's, a chemo, it's an old chemotherapy drug. That, there is not a clinical trial open for gemcitabine right now, but it's available off-label and we're aware of um, oncologists who have been treating patients with it. It's, I think, too soon to know. We don't have any anecdotal responses at this point. So I think that's still just in mice and there's obviously a big asterisk around that. Um, you know, other drugs that have shown activity in, um, in, in mice, um, you know, there's a, uh, it's a drug called a PI3 kinase inhibitor, a drug called an ATR inhibitor, et cetera. You can kind of go, um, we, we could follow up with more information about that. But I think the, the point is that at, the, you know, at, at this point, all of the drugs, almost all the drugs that are showing promise in mice are either available through a clinical trial or off-label. And that is 
the evidence to support that is on the website, on the, um, the drug therapy list that Shannon, I think, put in uh, the chat higher up. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and then my last, I, had, I was going to ask you about this anyway, that gemcitabine. If someone was just desperate, 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 could a doctor just order that medicine for them? Without, yeah. a, you know, just without a clinical trial since it's already been in use? It's available off-label, widely used for a number of tumor types. A lot of oncologists have experience with it. The dosing regimen is known. Side effect profile is known. I mean, it's not a benign drug necessarily, but. Right. Um, but, but you don't know about the response with Cordoma patients. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to look through all of the. So the, the chat. So I don't know if anyone has any lingering questions in the chat. Sarah, have you seen any that I've overlooked? Um, there was a question, Josh, about uh, the use of placebos in Cordoma clinical trials. Is that typically a part of Cordoma clinical trials and why or why not? Yeah, the vast majority of the clinical trials that have been designed for Cordoma or that Cordoma patients are eligible for are not placebo controlled. So that means if you go on the trial, you're gonna get the drug. There was one trial, one of the brachyuri vaccine trials that, not the current one, but the previous one, where there was, um, it was an active control. It wasn't, I guess you, you could think of it as a placebo, but everyone got treatment. Basically some patients got radiation alone plus or some patients got radiation plus the vaccine and other patients got radiation plus placebo. Um, but everyone got treated, everyone got at least radiation. So it, you know you weren't leaving the tumor unchecked. Um, there was specific reasoning for that, um, but, and, and, and there might indeed be reasons in the future where there needs to be a controlled trial, but more than likely it's going to be an active control um, you know, another another potential design might be, um, you know, a, a drug therapy compared to another drug therapy that we know has been used historically and has had modest or minimal success. So an example being Gleevec. There's a lot of data now of for patients who have been treated with Gleevec. Um, and maybe there's modest benefit for some patients, but no one's been cured to our knowledge with Gleevec and the best responses have been uh, fleeting. So you could use that as a control, um, you know, so patients are getting some benefit, but you know, you know that, you know, hopeful, hopefully the, the, the drug that's being tested would have a, a superior uh, response. So that's, that's one potential example of a trial design where you're, you're not getting a placebo, you're getting an active control and um, at least you're not, letting the tumor grow unchecked. But but it's a very important question because historically there have been trials, not for Cordoma necessarily, that have been designed, I think without really taking into consideration the, you know, I guess without putting without putting oneself in the shoes of patients and thinking about what it means to participate in a placebo controlled study. I think there is rightful re reluctance or skepticism. I, I guess speaking personally, I think I would be pretty uh, uh, reticent to participate in a placebo-controlled study in general, but there are certain instances where it would make sense, and I think it just has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. So, um, yeah, you, you, uh, again, just to summarize, there, there isn't one right now, and, and probably the mi minority of trials going forward would involve a placebo, but in some cases, it's it's necessary and worthwhile. I'm seeing one more question, and then I, I think we could encourage people to just follow up offline if there's any that we missed or, or more that people want to ask. Uh, the question is, are there any updates on combining drugs such as afatinib with other drugs to have more of a kill effect? Not yet in the clinic, but this is a high priority from a, a preclinical research perspective. So a big, uh, a big focus, upcoming focus in Cordoma Foundation Labs is to try to find combinations with EGFR inhibitors. 
Um, we, I, I'm, I'm so proud of our team. Uh, we, uh, the, uh, our, uh, the, the team in the lab presented a poster uh, down uh, in Orlando at AACR, the American Association of Cancer Research annual meeting, which is like, it's the world's largest cancer meeting um, or cancer biology meeting, if you will. So 20 plus thousand cancer researchers from all over the world. And, um, and so we, we presented data that came out of our, our lab seeking to identify um, uh, you know, predictors of tumors that might be responsive or unresponsive to EGFR inhibitors. There are two goals of that. One is to spare patients who are unlikely to respond from having to try EGFR inhibitors. The other goal is to figure out if the thing or things that are causing certain tumors to be resistant um, could be uh, could point to a combination approach. Um, and so um, maybe someone from our from the team could post a link to that. So you could see our poster online. Um, but there's a really interesting finding, which is that the the the, the cordoma tumors that seem to be resistant to uh, drugs like a fatinib seem to have a particular signature. Um, and we don't yet know what, what the therapeutic implications of that are, but there could well be some. So that's something we're very actively chasing down. But there's a handful of other experiments that are kind of just in the queue and just waiting for us to have capacity to take them on um, to try to identify other resistance mechanisms, to EGFR inhibitors, other uh, potential that could point to potential combinations. There's, there's a whole series of things that need to be done there that we're very eager to take on. I'll just highlight one, one hypothesis right now, which is the combination of uh, EGFR inhibitors and CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, there's a number of reasons to think that that is a fruitful, you know, potentially synergistic combination. Uh, there's still more data to generate before I think there is a compelling enough case to move forward with a clinical trial, but it's something we have our eyes on and are um, kind of actively working to move forward. I think it's also the timing of that combination is quite um, uh, good in that we're going to get a readout from the cetuximab trial and the afatinib trial this year and or next year. There's also a trial with a drug called palbocycle, which is a CDK4-6 inhibitor. We're going to get a readout from that probably this year. Um, and, and so we'll know what the results are single agent uh, with each of with those drugs. And then that will allow us to design a trial that can determine whether the, the a potential combination with those two classes of drugs would be superior to uh, the single agent. Um, I think if anyone has specific questions about potential combinations with EGFR inhibitors, um, it's probably not too soon to talk to an oncologist. My suspicion is that the answer is going to be, we just don't know enough yet to prescribe that, but uh, it's, it's worth having the conversation, I would say. Any final questions? Okay, well, I really appreciate everyone joining and uh, everyone's questions and all the kind words and all that so many of you have done to make everything we've discussed today possible. Um, you know, I um, uh, a lot of the questions that were asked are personally relevant for me now having experienced a recurrence recently. And uh, I will just say that um, uh, obviously there is anxiety that comes with that, but at the same time, I feel now much more hopeful than I have ever felt previously. And some of you have maybe heard me say that in the past, but it is definitely true that every year, we, if we look back, the, the progress that's been made dwarfs what's been made previously, but more importantly, the speed with which we can move forward and the opportunities that we have available to us looking forward, um, you know, just continues to increase. So we've not yet plateaued, we've not hit a point, we, you know, we're not hitting dead ends. Um, the, our, our speed potential and our, the, the universe of possibilities in front of us just continues to grow. And that is 
uh, incredibly encouraging. So I think there's just, there's a lot of reason for optimism now. Um, you know, some of the things that you've heard us, we've talked about today or that you've heard us talk about previously, investments in early state, early brachyuri drug discovery, investments in drug repurposing, the Cordoma Foundation lab, all of those things are really starting to bear fruit now. And the lab in particular is just allowing us to move so much faster on so many different fronts. Um, I think we're gonna start to see the impact of that in terms of clinical trials, you know, more numerous clinical trials and clinical trials happen, you know, starting faster in the next, you know, year, couple years. So um, very, very exciting time. Um, but obviously, you know, for those who of us who are in the thick of it, um, you know, we can't move fast enough. So we're, we are racing and so appreciate everyone's support to help make that possible. Um, uh, I guess just to close out here, if there are any lingering questions, or if you want to drill down further on anything, um, you know, we're always, always, uh, always eager to, um, to help or, you know, to, um, to hear from anyone. So feel free to reach out. And then um, we hope to see many of you at the upcoming community conference, July uh, uh, 14th and 15th in Boston. Um, we've got a great lineup. So Shannon has uh, uh, once again, uh, put together an, an amazing agenda. We've got, um, you know, great ask the experts, and, but also a lot of, um, providers, you know, experts in, you know, the managing the various symptoms and side effects and issues associated with survivorship and, and side effects. Um, and it'll just be a great opportunity to reconnect uh, after not having seen a lot of people for a very long time. So again, hope to see you there. Um, and we'll probably do this again in a few months. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll see some of you there as well. Um, all right, we'll sign off now. Thanks again. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Josh. Bye, everyone.